Okay, so this represents uh, a little bit of a uh, an experiment. So uh, we're going to try and do uh, some documentation, video documentation for Eman 2, and rather than just recording 15-minute videos, I'm going to do these live chat sessions uh, where people can ask questions uh, uh, interactively. It's okay, I've got a clock here. You don't have to actually put it up. Uh, so I'm going to do these interactive uh, online sessions uh, so people can uh, ask questions during during the events and that sort of thing. So this represents a test of the technology. Uh, so this is being broadcast using uh, Google Hangouts on air. So everything that is said in this room will be recorded in the uh, in the online thing. So just be aware that anything you say in here may be recorded for posterity. Um, the uh, the way it works is you set up the Hangout. Up to 10 people can join the Hangout online and interactively ask questions live, and, and uh, you, know, you can see their faces and stuff. And then an unlimited number of people can watch a live stream of the presentation, and they can ask questions by entering text questions. And you can see here through this horrible uh, infinite view, uh, if I go to the questions answer tab, you can see that uh, Kushal is logged in, and he asked a question, does it start in five minutes already? So people will ask questions, and they'll appear here as, as the uh, meeting goes on, uh, at least if anyone's logged on watching. I, did, I only invited people about an hour or two ago, so uh, we'll, we'll see if anyone actually shows up this time. Uh, so uh, my goal today is to go through the standard Eman tutorial very quickly, not in such a way that I expect everyone to be able to follow along and I'm not going to be helping people individually and stuff. We're just going to try and go through it very quickly before noon when we, uh, when we have another event scheduled in this room and we'll see how far we can get. Um, so I've downloaded the demo data. I'll go ahead and untar that. Can everyone read that text all right? It's big enough? All right. So this was from the workshop I gave in Beijing last summer, but it's the same data set that we've been using for the last 10 years, something like that now, eight years, I guess. So this was data collected in 2005 by Dong Hua on the Joel, now, now defunct Joel 3000, um, and it was used for the, uh, for the Groyel, four angst from Groyel paper. This is only a small subset of the data. Uh, the, what you download... Oops... What you download is uh, just uh, a location of all the boxes, so you don't have to box the whole thing out yourself, and the original micrographs file. Now, let's see. Yeah, so my plan here is I'm going to go through this, as I said, fairly quickly. When I get to a point where we have to wait for something to finish, then I'll uh, answer questions until whatever it is is done. <laughs> so uh, the first step in running ref refinement in, in Eman 2.1 is you run E2 workflow uh, in a directory that you set up for that purpose. So the directory should basically be empty except maybe for your micrographs or something like that. So we'll launch E2 workflow. Sorry, E2 project manager. I guess I'm thinking back to Eman 2.0. E2 project manager. <laughs> Good start. So we're launching E2 Project Manager. Uh, the tet font will be a little bit small for this, but hopefully you'll be able to see enough that you can at least get, uh, get the idea of what's going on. So the first thing I'm going to do is go up to the menu and edit the project, and I will enter the uh, information about the particle I'm reconstructing in the micrographs. So we'll say the mass is 800, uh, the C sub S is 4.1, the voltage is 300, and the angst per pixel is 2.1. That's all documented uh, in the uh, workshop tutorial. Okay, once I've done that, I need to get the data into the project. I can either do this interactively with this evaluate and import micrograph step, or I can do it uh, just automatically by importing the micrographs. In both of these processes, an approximation, a rough estimate of the CTF parameters of the micrographs are made during the process. I'll go ahead and... Uh, do the interactive one quickly first, just so you get an, a, a feel for it, but uh, we'll mostly use the non-interactive one to bring them in. Okay, so you can see that all the default parameters should be filled in properly. 
it gets those from the project. Okay, now the first time you oh, and any windows open up uh, in Eman 2, uh, you'll see they just go in random locations more or less on the screen. Uh, once you've rearranged them within a particular project, it should remember that arrangement the next time we open the program. So once I've got these things sitting in a, a semi-reasonable sort of orientation, and hopefully you normally have a pretty big screen when you're trying to do this. So once we've got these in a reasonable orientation, if I quit the program, and then I go back and launch the same program, program again, hopefully everything will show up in the same place. Now you'll note on the Mac we have to click on the little rocket ship icon to bring everything to the front. But you can see all the windows are back where I put them. So you can see when you load a micrograph like this, we'll see this tiled view of the overall micrograph. Uh, this indicates uh, the regions that it's using for, picking the, uh, uh, for computing the power spectrum. Uh, and it will automatically compute to uh, try and fit the CTF parameters. If it fails to fit the CTF parameters, it'll just set it to a default value of one micron or something like that. Uh, if I just say down, for example, uh, you can see it'll, as it loads the new image, it's automatically fitting it as it goes. Now, the goal here is really just to get an approximate value fitted to focus. And you can see it's doing a pretty reasonable job of it. Um, there are a bunch of different things we can do with this uh, interface. Uh, if I want to import particles or sorry, imp import micrographs into the project, I hit this import button over here. There are also a bunch of sh uh, keyboard shortcuts that are defined for this window here, so you don't have to use the mouse very much. I can use the up and down arrows here. If I use the left and right arrows, it will actually modify the defocus values slightly. Uh, and if I press the I button, it will import the micrograph into the project. And I can press the U button if I accidentally imported one of the project and I want to unimport it. Uh, and importing it into the project in this uh, uh, in, in Eman 2.1 all it means is that it's going to copy the micrograph, micrograph into a folder called micrographs. And if it's not in HDF format, it will convert it to HDF format. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead now and import all of the uh, micrographs into the project. So I just go to this original micrographs folder, select them all, and make sure the parameters are OK here. I'm not going to try for astigmatism correction in the first stage of processing normally. Normally, you should go through the whole process without any astigmatism correction. And at the end, once you've got a good structure, then you go back and you can add the astigmatism as, uh, you know, by sort of fine-tuning things and trying to improve things. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend no, doing it from the start. There's no danger of importing something twice and having two copies of the same No, thing. it'll use the same name. If you have a naming convention where you collect the, uh, you say you collect on day one and your micrographs are named one, two, three, four, five, and then you collect on day two and you name your micrographs one, two, three, four, five, so you have the same file name. Uh, there is a checkbox you can use. Um, it was in, it's in the other panel. I guess it hasn't been added to this panel yet. Uh, where we'll use the the last name of the folder uh, as part of the name of the image when it imports it. So, but but you when you when you uh, uh, selected those micrographs, you selected the same ones that. Plus a lot more. I hadn't imported any yet. Oh, okay. I had just looked at them. Okay. Okay, I see. You were evaluating. I was just evaluating. I never hit that import button, uh -huh. so they weren't actually being imported. Okay, so you can uh, hit this button over here, and it'll open up a progress view, and you can see how far along it is in the process that it's doing. And if you watch the, con if you watch the console while it runs, uh, you'll be able to see the output from the various programs. In this case, you can see the CTF values as they're, as they're uh, running, as they're coming out. Uh, this won't take very long, so I won't do any asides. Maybe we can check and see if anyone else has joined yet. Ah, okay. Uh, Wa, can you hear me? Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so Wa, when uh, can you see me log on? Okay. Uh, so while I'll answer your question, which is, no, we can't hear you. You logged in as a passive observer. You didn't accept my, the invitation that I sent you to the uh, meeting. If you accept the invitation, then you actually become a live part of the conference. If you just watch the streaming presentation, then you can only ask questions by sending these the sort of text messages, and then I'll see them appear. Uh, Greg, yes, I see you. Oh, actually, any if you're logged on, you can actually see uh, your own uh, your own names appearing here on the side. So there are a few people who are watching us live. All right, it finished importing the raw data. If I use the file browser, which is this button right here, uh, you'll see that I now have a directory called micrographs and another directory called info. 
I will go back and talk a little bit more about those in a couple of minutes, but let me get the next process started. So the next thing we have to do is uh, locate the particles, box out the particles. Now, we're going to skip the step of interactively picking particles because we don't have time to do it as part of the hour demonstration. We already have the box locations and files that I provided as part of the demonstration, so I can just go to these this uh, box coordinate import item and browse, and I have my original boxes directory here, and I can just grab all those, and they have the same names as the micrographs, and then I can just launch it. And that won't take very long. So if we look now, uh, I'll go ahead and run the interactive boxing and hit the Browse button here. And you'll see we now have stored boxes here for all but one of the images. And I didn't include any box locations for that image because that's the test image I have people do it interactively on normally when we're doing the demonstration. So we have already got all of our box files imported. That's good. Uh, I'm going to set my box size to 140. Uh, actually, I'm not going to launch this program. I'm going to do the generate output step. So I'm just going to assume all of my box locations are fine. And set the box size to 140. Select all of the images that have stored box locations. Uh, and I've got right particles set up and uh, exclude edges. Exclude edges means if it sees any particles where the part of the particle went off the edge of the image, it will automatically mark those as bad as it's doing this process. Okay, so we'll do that. So now it's actually pulling all of the particle data out. Now that's also only going to take a few seconds, so we'll just let that finish. Okay, now if we use the browser, we'll see that while it's doing this, we now have one more uh, uh, folder here called particles. And inside that, we'll see these HDF files, which contain all of the particle images. So we can see that these are 140 by 140, and you can see how many images there are in each of these files. So it's all done. So we're going pretty fast here. We've got boxed out particles. Now we can go ahead and do our automatic CTF fitting. Now we already have a rough estimate of the defocus, which was done in that first stage when it was looking at the whole micrograph. So, uh, and all these parameters should basically be correct. The only thing I'm going to change here is I'm going to change the oversampling to 2. If your box size is less than about 256, usually it's a good idea to do some oversampling. The oversampling just gives you more points in the CTF curve when you're trying to fit it. It takes each particle and it pads it out to a larger box size. If you say 2, it makes it twice as big, or 3, it makes it three times as big, and then it uses that when it's computing the power spectrum just to give you a little more a detail in the curves. What is it padded with? Uh, zeros. So the particles are all normalized such the edge of the images is set to zero and the standard deviation is set to one. Uh, so then you pad it with zeros outside the edge of the box. Okay. So uh, I have this cur defocus hint box checked. That's the default. And that means that it won't go more than about a tenth or a couple tenths of a micron away from the uh, originally the existing defocus values wherever they came from. Uh, if I uncheck that box, then it'll do the defocus determination again from scratch. Now, this is a very useful box. I could go to the Browse window, and I could select all the particles. But if I have 2,000 micrographs in my project or something, that's kind of a pain. I have to go through that whole list. If you just check all particles, it will apply it to all of the files in the particles directory automatically. And there are also some filters that you can use. Here, we've got min particle, min qual. Um, and I guess that's all we have right here. There are other places where it, where it has more. Uh, so if I said min particle 50, for example, then it would only fit the CTF for particles where for uh, micrographs where there were at least 50 particles available. And if min qual was set to say 5, which is the, the <coughs> default value, then it wouldn't try to fit the CTF of any images that were, were below that. So we'll go ahead and get that started. What's the quality of 5? Uh, so the quality is purely a, a user-defined oh, value. Oh. So you can set a value between 0 and 9. Uh, it defaults to 5. And uh, so if you're looking at the images and you say, oh, this is one isn't quite as good, you might set it to a 4. And if this one's even worse, I'll set it to a 3, whatever. It just allows you to sort of group the particles based on perceived quality. But you can use it for whatever you like. Uh, uh, you can use it for anything you like. There are several different places where you can uh, access that quality. So, All right. Will the current focus hit check the header or just the JSON 
uh, it uses just the JSON file because there's nothing stored in the particle header at this point normally. Um, yeah. Once the particles have been phase flipped, then it's stored there. But the JSON file is, is the main source of all that information. So it's already finished fitting the CTF of all those particles. Uh, now I can go to the interactive tuning and take a look at what we got. So again, I'll just check the all particles box. Uh, and I'm also going to check this sort defocus box. That way, the order they appear in the interactive browser will be sorted by defocus. Uh, it makes it a little bit more convenient when you're scrolling through them and trying to evaluate them. So we'll launch that. And again, the windows will appear in a random location because this is the first time I've used this program in this project. So we'll set them up as we like them. Ah, now you see we have a problem, something I neglected to do earlier. Uh, the particles are always supposed to be black, sorry, be white on a darker background. And you can see that my particles <laughs> here are dark on a lighter background. Okay, now we've got, uh, I'll show you how to deal with that uh, when, when we get to, to a later step. So for now, it doesn't hurt anything. When you're determining CTF parameters, it doesn't matter whether they're black or white. The parameters are exactly the same. Um, so let's look at the different windows we have here. So we have the window with the familiar two to, uh, you know, 1D plot, basically, of the, uh, of the fit CTF. And there are several curves in that we'll get back to in a second. Then we have the 2D window, which shows the two-dimensional power spectrum for that image. And then we have this little window, which just shows you a few representative particles. Now, the first image it shows you is actually the average of the other 20 particles that it shows you. So here are 20 different particles, just the first 20 from the file. And then the first image that you get is just the average of all those without any alignment or anything like that. It just helps you see if they're sort of well-centered in the box on average and whether there's a lot of spurious stuff around the outside of, of the particle. Um, now this window, in its default display, what you're seeing is the uh, background subtracted power spectrum uh, and then the fit curve. So the black curve is the background subtracted power spectrum and the blue curve is the fit. Now you'll notice it doesn't fit very well at low resolution and that's because we don't have a one-dimensional structure factor determined for our data yet. Right now, it's just using sort of an empirical, structure, gen, you know, generic structure factor. So it'll never match very well at low resolution here. But you'll see that the positions of the peaks at higher resolution, and I can use my right mouse button to drag a box here and, and zoom in, the, the, uh, part of the locations of the zeros match reasonably well out to uh, you know, fairly high resolution here. Now, we're only really targeting to get to 8 to 10 angstroms uh, today because we're doing this in an hour. Uh, so it really only matters if we have good fits out to about here. There are strategies you can use to sort of fine-tune this a little bit out at high resolution that we can, uh, we can talk about later. Now, if you right-click without dragging, it'll zoom back out all the way. Now, you'll also notice if you look very carefully that there's a dotted black line. The dotted black line is uh, doing the background subtraction in a different way. If you have a really nice data set uh, where you don't have a very strong background in the images, then the dotted black line and the solid black line should be right on top of each other, basically. If you have some problem with your data, meaning that the background is a strong signal in it for some reason, uh, then you'll see that there's a separation between those lines. Now, the things that could cause that are if you have a continuous carbon film, continuous carbon substrate, that will also have an oscillatory CTF associated with it, and that'll cause some separation. If you have something in the buffer, uh, for example, ARENA has this issue a lot with detergent. If you put a, have a strong detergent concentration in the buffer, uh, or if you have large buffering molecules, or if you have a lot of protein that's falling apart, uh, or if your particle density is really high and you've got neighboring particles in the box, uh, then those are all things which would cause, se cause separation between the black and the dotted black curve. Okay? Uh, Do you interpret that as separated or no? I would say that those are those. That's separated. that's quite good. Those are. Okay. I mean, it doesn't have. It's not going to be ever, never never going to be exactly the same, but it'll be pretty close. So you can see if we scroll through some of these, you'll see there's a little bit of separation there, but it's not a significant okay. amount. Uh, if we looked that's at if we looked at something like calcium release channel, you'd see that the uh, black, solid black curve was half the height of the dotted black curve, and basically what that means is that. The perceived contrast when you look at the whole micrograph, when you say, oh, look, I've got great signal out to four angstroms, that's, not, that's an illusion. It's not necessarily reality. Uh, because what you're seeing is the contrast from everything in the image, not just the contrast from the particles. What this is doing is assessing the part contrast from just the particles. So All right. what's, what's the difference between the way the black one and the dotted one? Um, so if we have time, I'll answer that question later. But that's a longer discussion.
that's probably something I'll do in one of the later tutorials because it takes about 30 minutes to really sort of go through the details of everything that's going on. Okay, so here's the quick version. So which one would you use? Uh, so you, if you're just trying to get the defocus, the dotted black line is probably okay. And in fact, that's when it auto fits. It uses the dotted black curve to get a quick e rough estimate of the defocus. Uh, if your uh, difference between those curves is due to, uh, say, having continuous carbon film, then the carbon film may be at a slightly different depth than the particles, in which case you want to be using the defocus of the particles, not the defocus of the carbon. So for any fine tuning of the defocus, you'd want to use the solid black one if you can. And again, that's what the automatic fitting does. All right. So it looks like we're probably OK here. I can just go through these all quickly, and I can see that the defocus values are at least pretty good. OK, so all my defocuses look like they came out fine. So I'll do the next step, which is to generate a structure factor. Uh, now, often I would just go through and pick a subset of the images. Uh, but in this case, all of my images are fine, and I've only got about 20 of them. So we'll go ahead and just use all of them. Uh, it only needs probably, you know, 10 or 15 images to do a pretty good job of determining a structure factor. And adding more won't add a whole lot to the process. If you use, say, 1,000 images, then this thing that's streaming by really fast on the bottom of the screen here would be going a lot more slowly. And it would take maybe 5 or 10 minutes if, if I was using a lot of images. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would usually pick sort of my best uh, 15 or 20. It's important that you cover a range of different defocus values when you're doing that. But, uh, uh, but it do other than that, it doesn't really matter what you use. So once I've done that, I will go back and redo the automatic fitting one time just to sort of make, make, make sure that it's taking that structure factor into account. There's no point in iterating this process, though. I don't, wanna, I don't need to go back and determine the structure factor again and redo the automatic fitting again. And so there's, no, there's no point in iteration. So this is just a one-time refitting. All right, let me just check and see if there are any questions showing up, other than can you hear me, can you see me? Uh, OK, Wa says he hears me well. That's good. Um, so at least that part of the technology seems to be working. OK, uh, so if anyone has any questions that's watching this not via the live interface, please feel free to type them. And once in a while, I will go over and check and see if there are any, there's anything appearing over there. Uh, but keep in mind, if you started late, that you may be seeing what happened a few minutes ago, so it may be a couple of minutes after you type your question before I actually see it. Just the quick question, when you generate the structural factor, yep. like if you want to just use 20, like wrap, and like you just click on the left and select these. Or... So if I was going to use 20, I would probably go in and go into the browser, and I would take one of the columns like uh, signal to noise ratio at high resolution or signal to noise ratio at low resolution and I would take the first n particles from there uh, or sorry n micrographs from there uh, if I saw that the defocuses weren't varying very much I mean very often the the far from focus images will have the best low resolution contrast so if I see that there isn't much defocus variation then I might I might say pick some of these by dragging and then hold down uh, oops, sorry click some of these by dragging, and then hold down Command or Control and pick a few of the other ones as well. But, yeah. All right. So now that we've done that again, we can go back to the interactive fitting. So we've refit our data using the structure factor, and all the windows should open up again. We'll bring them back to the front. And now you can see that we actually have a reasonably good fit. You can see it's still not an absolutely perfect fit, and the reason that's the case is because of trying to satisfy both the high resolution fitting and, the, and uh, the low resolution at the same time. If I play with the B factor a little bit here, you'll see that I actually can get it to match at low resolution pretty well. Now you'll notice that there's two peaks in the structure factor here, one right there and one right there. These peaks are caused by features visible in certain, certain orientations of GROEL. You'll note that I don't see the same relative peak height here in all the images. That's because I have different preferred orientation in different images. Some images will have more top views, and other images will have more <coughs> side views. So the balance between those peaks isn't necessarily going to be exactly the, the, the same. So you, I, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is you shouldn't expect to see a perfect fit here. You should expect to see the peak locations to come out about right, and you should, at high resolution, you know, you should try and get things to fit reasonably well. Unlike in Eman 1, these B factor numbers aren't really used for anything in Eman 2. They're used a little bit when they're determining the when you're determining the structure factor, uh, but it really mostly only affects the structure factor in sort of this intermediate resolution regime anyway. It doesn't impact the high resolution, which is 
coming from an external source. Now, I'm, I'm making all sorts of assumptions here. Again, my goal today is really just to get through this tutorial and get to an answer, and then in subsequent uh, conferences like this, I will go into details in some of the various things. Normally, this is something we do over, say, a two-day period. Um, that was Stephen calling, uh, and then he gave, changed his mind, I guess. Um, so uh, we're going to go through just sort of the broad overview today, so you see how the whole process fits together, and then all these detailed questions about, well, how do we get the structure factor in detail, uh, how is the CTF, CTF fitting, we'll, we'll get back to uh, in, in later discussions. When you determine the structure factor, you want to include different defocuses uh, because they have different low resolution behavior and that sort of averages out all the low resolution behavior. I said the B factor doesn't matter very much. Uh, I meant to say you should try and include different representative particles at different defocuses. As long as you include a couple representatives from different defocuses, the bulk of the images could come from mostly one defocus. It would probably be fine. All right, so we've got our CTF fit correctly now. Now we just need to generate output. So this is where I'm going to take care of that little inversion problem we were having. Uh, so the particles were dark. I'm going to make the uh, CTF corrected particles white. Okay. So now I could also correct for it. I could go back to the particles generate output here, uh, generate output particles. There's also an invert button I could have used there. Uh, for this, it doesn't really matter. So we'll just we'll just do it here, and I'll say invert. I'm going to invert deal do all of the particles. Uh, I will generate phase flipped particles, I will generate phase flipped high pass filtered particles, and I will generate Wiener filtered particles. So I'll generate all the different possibilities. There's also a couple of text boxes here now. These didn't used to be there, so for any of you who have played with Emen2 before, uh, these allow you to enter uh, general purpose uh, pro image processing operations, which can be applied to uh, a separate set of output particles. So it'll generate the normal phase flip particles, phase flip high pass particles, Wiener filtered particles, etc. But then if you enter anything in these boxes, it will also generate one more stack of particles, which is phase flipped and has both of these processors applied to them. This allows you to do things like apply masks, for example. So if, for example, you're doing like BMV that Zhao does, uh, and he has really high particle density in the box, and the particles are intruding on each other, that sort of thing. This allows you to impose a mask a little bit outside the edge of a single particle, and that can help the alignments later on. Um, and this way you can actually incorporate it into the whole processing scheme. So anyway, I'm just going to generate these. I'm not going to do any special processing, and we'll launch it. And again, we should be able to follow that in the running tasks window over here. I'm surprised you didn't do Refine by SNR. Yeah, so the Refine by SNR button it will allow you to fine-tune the defocus values, at mostly at high resolution, based on uh, maximizing the signal-to-noise ratio. And if I were trying to get to five or six angstroms, that would make a big difference. But since we're only interested in eight to ten today, it really won't make much difference. Uh, my, my zeros are fit well enough at that resolution range already that it's just wouldn't make a noticeable difference. Ooh, we've got a test. All right. Okay, uh, it's getting there. Almost done. Okay, a couple more steps, and we'll be to a point where we have a longer delay, and I can talk about some of the files that we have in our uh, directory and such. All right. So the next thing we need to do is build a particle set. Uh, so when you're processing the the, the image data. Uh, you may not want to work with all of the images. You may want to work with a subset of the images, and you may want to do one refinement with all of the data, and another refinement with some of the data. Rather than making a whole bunch of copies of all of your particles, uh, sets are a way of making these, these text files, basically, which have lists of particle files and particle numbers in them, uh, and you can then do the image processing on those instead of having to copy your data over and over again. So I'm going to make two stacks here. I'm going to make a small stack. I'll just call it small. 
uh, which includes only a few of the best images. And we'll use those for making 2D class averages and making our initial model and that sort of thing. In reality, all of the images in this particular data set are good, but uh, we'll pick the ones that have the highest, uh, highest contrast at low resolution here. And you can see I'm picking just, just under 1,000, around 1,000 of them. So I've got about the first five micrographs here. Okay, uh, so I don't want to say all particles because then that would override the ones that I'd selected here and I'd get everything. I will check this exclude bad box. This will make sure that any particles that were marked as bad because they were off the edge of the box or something are excluded from the sets. Uh, if I check this, this also makes sure that it only includes particles that have phase flip uh, output files. So if I had only done the CTF generate output step for particles of a certain, you know, a certain subset of the particles, this would make sure that when I said all particles here, it only included those. I know that's, that's it's okay if you don't understand all those points. Okay, so you can see this process, the set building is almost instantaneous. I can see the output in the console here. It, made ni it put 983 particles in the set, and it generated output files for these types of files. So the uncorrected particles, the phase, fli uh, the phase flipped, the wiener filtered, and the phase flipped high pass filtered. If I had generated some additionally filtered particles that were masked or low pass filtered or something like that, then I would have seen another set here with underscore proc in it. And now if I browse, I'll see I have a new subdirectory called sets, and in there I see these four different set files uh, which contain 983 particles. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and start generating 2D class averages. And while we're doing that, I'll look through some of the output files. So, far. so I need to pick my input file, and I'll use the high-pass filtered phase-flipped particles for that. I will generate maybe, I don't know, 24 classes. The other parameters are probably fine. The only other thing I'll do is I'll add a par something to the parallel box. I'll say thread colon 4, which will use all four processors on my laptop. Uh, the other options down here, we shouldn't really need to do anything to. The defaults are pretty good for most purposes. I am not going to shrink in this case. I've already, the data has already been downsampled to 2.1 angstroms per pixel. Its box size is 140, so I don't think we need to shrink any further than that. It'll, it'll run pretty fast already. Okay, so it's going. Um, and we will probably intercept it before it finishes running, because it'll give us pretty good class averages after one or two iterations. Okay, while this is running, let's go ahead and take a look at what we've got in some of these directories. And sorry, I can't easily make the uh, font bigger without uh, uh, making the screen smaller effectively, so uh, it, it may be a little difficult to read some of this. I'll try and say what it is we're looking at. So we have a subdirectory called e2boxer cache. That's used in the particle picking process, and because I uh, had started to launch uh, one, one of those programs, it, it created that directory, but it doesn't really have anything useful for the user. Uh, there's micrographs, which we already saw contains the micrograph files. These are just the pre-boxed micrograph files. It, it doesn't contain, there's no CTF correction or anything like that here. Uh, there's the orig orig boxes and orig micrographs. Those were the files I started with, and actually I'm going to delete those in a couple of minutes just to uh, save some space. Then I have particles, which now contains not just the boxed out particles, but it also contains the phase flipped and the phase flipped high pass filtered, et cetera, versions of each of these particles. And you'll notice that we have the name of the micrograph followed by underscore, underscore, CTF wiener, for example. The underscore, underscore is sort of a special separator, which uh, uh, is for pro uh, uh, particles that have been processed automatically in some fashion. Uh, so we can see how many particles are in each stack, et cetera. Uh, when I click on these in the browser, I get a variety of options so I can look at them and visualize them. And we'll be doing more of that in a, a couple of minutes. Uh, then we have the micrograph. Oh, sorry, we already looked at micrographs. Then we have the info directory. The info directory contains all of the metadata for the project. Uh, now, this, all right, there are two types, well, three types of JSON files that we're seeing here. Uh, there is something named micrograph underscore info dot JSON. So dh3961 underscore info.json, for example. Then we have these orig micrographs, followed by the name info.json. And then we have a project.json file. These, these orig micrographs, shouldn't actually be there. 
that's something that if you use it, that when we re re put the beta 3 release of Eman 2.1 out, those shouldn't get created anymore. All the information should go in here. These are actually just empty files anyway. If we look at the info files, though, here for one of the actual micrographs, and I hit the info button, we can browse the contents of, of the, uh, the file. Okay, so if I look at boxes, for example, I can then see a list of all of the particle uh, particles that were boxed out, and okay. if I expand that out, I can see the coordinates of the particle and uh, that it was that was a manually boxed particle, for example. Uh, if I hit CTF, uh, I can see uh, the information that was stored for the CTF, which includes the CTF object, which gives us the defocus, the B factor, angst per pixel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I can look at the CTF frame. That's information that was determined from the overall micrograph rather than from the particles. So the CTF item is based on the particles. That's based on the whole frame. And then I've got the quality value, which is just an integer. Now, this is one way of looking at the contents of those files. You could also look at the file just by going to the command line and going to the right subdirectory. So I can see these info files here, and let me look at, for example, the project.json file. And you can see that these are actually human-readable text files. Okay, So I can see the global length per pixel value, global microscope CS, etc. As you can see, the various project parameters that I entered here. And I can do the same thing with some of these other files. Now, the micrograph files sometimes have a lot of stuff in them. Uh, some of it wasn't easily visible uh, when we were using the browser, but for example, there are a couple of images actually stored in those text files. Uh, and that can make looking at the file a little bit painful. There's also these background curves which are stored in there, for example, as part of the CTF. But all the information is in there, and technically it's all human-readable text. Uh, where is the original location of the, uh, of, of the box stored? The location of the box, the, all so everything about this micrograph, I should have used 3962 because there weren't any boxes in 3961. Uh, 3962, there we go. There's the box information. Oh. <laughs> so all of the information for that micrograph is now stored in one of these files. Okay. So now if you want to, you, we used to have this problem that if you wanted to take, say, a subset of your data and move it to a new project, it was really a pain to do because you had to extract information out of the database and it was just a mess. Now, all you have to do if you want to copy some of your data to a new project is copy the particle files you want to copy and copy the corresponding info files and that's it. They're just files that you can copy and, and all of the information will go along with it. Uh, Specifically, the box coordinates are also the box coordinates are also stored in the particle header. So the particles do know where they came from as well but that information is also stored in those JSON files. So I'm going to go ahead and remove my rich boxes and rich micrographs. I have all, all that information incorporated into the project anyway, so I don't need them anymore. And you can see this R2D01 directory has appeared now. That's where it's running the 2D class averaging process. So let me bring my uh, task manager back to the front. So you can see it's 36% through the overall refinement process. And if I go into my R2D01 directory, I can see that it's finished three iterations so far. So there are a variety of files here. Uh, the details on what all the files are described in the wiki. Uh, but the file I want to look at normally is the all refs file. And that will contain uh, the class averages sorted in order of uh, mutual similarity, basically. <coughs> So I can see I'm getting reasonable class averages out. They're not all perfect. This class average here isn't terrific at this point, but I can see some nice top views of GrowEL. I can see a bunch of different side views of GrowEL, uh, and they're in slightly different orientations if you look very carefully. Some of them, like these three, are almost in the same orientation. But you can see this one, it looks kind of smeared out on the side. That's because it's in an orientation sort of uh, uh, one fourteenth of a, of a circle <coughs> rotated from, from this orientation. So that's an actual view that you'd expect to see. And in some cases, you may see that the center separation is a little bit bigger, meaning the particles are very slightly tilted. And so they all get to have the same angle. They're aligned to each other. So basically, it picks, it picks the <coughs> particle it thinks has sort of the highest contrast, 
and then it aligns, uh, then it finds the particle that looks the, the next most like that and aligns to the first one, and it just sort of sequentially aligns its way through the data. Uh, it's not always going to be perfect. There will be some cases where, uh, you know, so the difference between this one and this one is probably that there's, uh, uh, well, actually, no, there's actually a feature difference here. So you can see there's a little gap there, and it's not very strong there. So these really are in slightly different orientations. If you make a lot of classes, sometimes you'll say, oh, the first two look almost the same. What's different? Usually that's going to be defocus. Uh, usually part of it, you'll get sort of some amount of classification based on defocus. <clears throat> anyway, so I'm going to let that run for a couple more iterations. Uh, while that's running, let's take a look at some of the browser capabilities. So uh, you notice when I double-clicked on that, it opened a tiled display window like this. And just like any of the windows in Eman, if I middle-click on the window, I'll get a control panel, which allows me to adjust things like the brightness and the contrast and the gamma and that sort of thing. I can see the histogram changing up there. Uh, in this 2D view, I can also do things like mark specific particles for deletion. Uh, I can build different sets of particle, subsets of particles for specific purposes. Uh, I'm not sure if that's working right now. In theory, you can rearrange the particles in memory. I think that's disabled right now in the Mac. Uh, but I can also change specific metadata items that it displays. So right now, it's just displaying the image number, but if I wanted to see, for example, I don't know, the standard deviation or something like that, uh, I, could, I could have it display that in the, that in the corner of the image. I could also make the font a little bigger so we can actually read the numbers. Okay. Uh, now, there's another view option, which is show stack. Oh, sorry, which show, sorry, show 2D. Show stack is what we do by default. Show 2D, which will show the particles in a single window. And now you can see I'm looking at one of 24. And then if I use the up arrow, I can scroll through the particles, and I can sort of compare them. I can see that, oh, look, the centering isn't exactly perfect among all these particles as I scroll through them. If I hit the middle mouse button here, again, we'll see a control panel. The single image control panel has a lot more features, though. For example, I can probe... Uh, specific regions in the image and measure uh, uh, density values. I can measure distances uh, if I set the angstrom per pixel value correct. It defaults to 1. I have to set it to 2.1 if I really want to measure things. So, uh, so here I can measure that the uh, length, hi height of Groyal is about uh, you know, 180, 160 to 180 angstroms. Uh, there's a draw mode, which actually allows me to modify the contents of the image. I don't want to do that right now. There's a, a Python mode, which lets me type one-line Python commands in and find things out or modify the image in specific ways. Uh, and then there's a save tab, which actually allows me to save the data in various ways, including a GIF animation uh, or a real movie, <coughs> if I want to save my sequence of images in some way. This is useful for, say, if you load a tomogram, you can quickly make little movies of, of sections of the tomogram. You can just type Python expressions. So the image is called IMG. So if I say something like IMG of sigma, which will give me the standard deviation of the image, uh, it will display the result in the oh, box down there. Right? Uh, display all types. No, you can do other things too. If I wanted to invert the contrast, I could, I could say IMG.molt minus one, and that will, uh, I'll have to update, that'll modify the image. It doesn't modify it on disk, it just modifies in memory, so I haven't really changed it. Um, Is there anything that I can save that? Yes, there was a save panel oh. where you could save files. All right, I think this is probably finished enough that we want to move on to the next step, otherwise we're not going to finish in time. So let's, I'm going to go ahead and kill the refine 2D so it's not eating up my CPU horsepower. And it may or may not show up as killed right away, but that's fine. I'll have to hit the refresh <laughs> button here to see what we're at, where we're at now. And you can see I now have it's finished six iterations, or seven iterations. And let me open that in a fresh window. And it's reasonable. It's good enough for our purposes. You can see some of them have gotten worse, but that just means that some of the better particles have gotten grouped with the better class averages, so that's fine. So I'm going to delete anything in here which I don't like. And I'm just going to keep a few good class averages. 
So I'll keep this nice looking top view and maybe this other kind of okay top. Uh, I want to have at least two top views in there. Uh, and I'll get rid of a couple more of those. So yeah, I don't like that one. All right, so we'll start with those. And we're going to use these to generate our initial model. So once I've picked these, I'm going to hit the Save button, and I'm going to call the, make a new file called good, good classes. <coughs> and now if I go back, you can see in my main project directory, I now have good classes with 10 images in it, and I will start making an initial model. All right, now I'm only going to have it do maybe five iterations, and I'll have it only do eight tries. I've got four processors on my machine, so I can, that, that'll run through sort of each one will make one. I'll set the symmetry. I'll set thread four for parallel. Uh, I won't bother shrinking. It should be okay. And then I need to pick the input file, which is good classes. So we'll go ahead and launch that. Okay, so you can see that now that the display updated, the uh, refined 2D went away. And if we go back to this tab, you'll see we can see the output as it's going. So this uh, this will take a couple minutes to run. So let's go back to the browser a little bit. I don't have. Oh, go ahead. Is it gonna make so it's, it has those three lines of output? Is it gonna make the number of tries times the number of iterations goes? So it doesn't actually save the output until it finishes the whole process because it evaluates them as, it, as it's going to. There's some flags you can set to get it to sort of save everything while it's running, uh, but that's not the default behavior. The default behavior is it will run... So I told it, I told it to make uh, eight initial models and use five iterations for each. So I will only see the last iteration, but I will see eight models when it finishes. <coughs> So what I was asking is when the phrase will part approximately 0.05 gigs of memory, but it's 40 times, does that mean it's done? Oh, yes, yes. So I am sorry. So yes, yes. The number of lines you see there will, uh, will, will match that. And I think... So yeah. this initial model was not... Um, you're, you're not worried about um, model bias, therefore it's got... Basically, it's using all the um, all the, the initial model generator generator is using all the data you told it to use, um, and would we have other to, ways of dealing with initial model bias. Would it pay to to, um, to do that uh, randomization of those initial models uh, past a certain resolution, or you don't care? The initial models are actually generated starting from random blobs in space. Uh, we can actually look okay. at that. Oh, it finished. Okay. So let's look at the results. So we got a directory called <coughs> initial models. And uh, you can see for each initial model, we have four files output. There's init, and that's the starting model that it used. Now, it's symmetrized, but other than being symmetrized, it's just random blobs in space. I, it has D7 symmetry imposed. Okay, so that's one of the initial models. There's another initial model. There's another initial model. Uh, there's another initial model, and if we open up the control panel here, we can scroll through these models sequentially if we want to see. So you can see one of the starting models was kind of flat like a pancake. Uh, another starting model was kind of elongated vertically, and another one was just kind of a ball. So it uses really random starting models. You're asking the same question. Where do the starting models come from? Yeah. It makes random noise in space, and it low-pass filters it, and it masks it. It's really random, except for the symmetry. Okay, so now let's take a look at one of the output structures. It is random noise. It's, I, I don't recall whether I generated it in real space or Fourier space, but it's uncorrelated random noise, so it should be random noise in both spaces. Okay, so here is the first initial model we got out. The first one is supposed to be the best one, and you can see it looks a lot like Groyel, so that's not a bad starting point. However, you'll note that it's 
got the wrong... Oh, no, it does have the right-handedness this time. Oh, we got lucky. Sometimes it has the wrong-handedness, sometimes it has the right-handedness, because uh, you can't determine that from 2D data. Uh, so if we if we look at, say, the, let, let's load a couple of these, and we can sort of scroll through them and see what we got. If I open up the control panel, I can look at these one at a time. So the first one looks very nice. The second one, uh, not so much. The third one definitely didn't work. The fourth one is one of the, is is a is a, a failure mode of uh, of Gruyel. Uh, let me go ahead and get the refinement started, and then we can go back and go into the initial models in a little more detail. <coughs> All right, so I don't need anything else here. The next thing to do is start a 3D refinement. And we've got about uh, 25 minutes left, so we'll see what we can get. Now, I'm going to do this two different ways. I'm going to run it on my laptop, and I'm going to run it on uh, a cluster node and show you how to run jobs on the cluster. So we'll get the laptop one started first, because I've only got four cores here. So I'll say E2 refine easy. I need to pick my input file, and oh. I don't. I haven't made a larger input file yet. I've only got my subset that has 983 particles. Well, for my laptop, since it doesn't have very much power, we'll just go ahead and use this really small subset. So again, I'll use the phase flipped high pass filtered subset, uh, and we'll just see what we can get out of 983. We might get to about 10 angstroms with with that many. We'll see. Uh, and then I'll on the cluster I'll process all of them. Then I have to pick my initial model. And that'll just be that model that we just generated. And I need to tell it what resolution I want it to get to. And I'm going to go ahead and tell it to go all the way to 9 angstroms. We'll say D7 uh, symmetry. We'll have it do I don't know, four iterations. Mass is fine. All these things should be OK. Well, I'm going to set the, set the speed to 7. And we'll get back to that. what that means again in a couple of minutes. And I'll say parallel thread colon 4, and there's another box here which is threads. There are two different types of things that it can do when it's doing parallel processing here, and we want it to use both of them. If you're using a laptop or something, we say thread, colon, n, and then we put n in this box here. And I'll show you in the cluster how that changes. Uh, and I think that's all we have to do. Everything else should be okay. So we'll get that going. And you'll see as soon as I hit that launch button, I'll have a subdirectory now called refine01. And that's where it's beginning the refinement. Uh, now let's get the data onto the cluster and get that refinement going too. So I need to make a new particle set. And I want to use all the particles this time. So I'll say all particles, exclude bad, and we'll call this, make the set name of this all, and launch. They've been flipped already? All of them. Flipped? Yeah. The face flipped. Yeah. Well, it generates sets for each of the different types, right? So I got I got a set for face lift high pass, high uh, Wiener filters. CD. It's not actually copying the data, so you can make as many of these as you like. They're just text files. So if I so if I uh, use the browser now, I will see that in sets I now have a set of sets for all, and each one of them has 5,160 particles in it. So now I need to get this data to the cluster. How are we going to do that? So the command you should always use to get data to and from the cluster is rsync. Some people know about SCP. Some people use SFTP. Uh, that's not the best way of doing it. The best way is to use rsync and specifically say rsync-avr. A tells it to keep the file change times and, and uh, uh, all the other parameters that are associated with the file is the same when it copies. V is verbose, and R is recursive, meaning it'll copy all the subdirectories, too. Now, the reason you use rsync instead of one of the other tools is rsync only copies things that have changed. So if I rsync my whole project to the cluster, and then I rsync again later, it will only copy the files that are new or have changed since the last time I copied. I won't have to wait for all of that, you know, 20 gigabytes or whatever of data to copy again. So we'll say rsync avr workshop Beijing prism, and as long as my username's the same on both machines, I don't have to put that in, so I just say prism colon. And that'll put it in my home directory on prism. For those of you listening who might not be from this lab, prism is just the name of one of our clusters, if that weren't obvious. So you can see it running. 
Let me just check really quickly and see if there were any other questions showing up. I think all of our questions are... Oh, can I run... All right, here we go. We've got a question uh, from uh, Demelia Dahm. Can I run a reference imposed 2D class average refinement? What is the command? Uh, would I use a model as an input or projections as inputs? Uh, no, for the 2D class averaging process, technically there is, is a, a, a mode you can use uh, which lets you bootstrap the process with files that you provide it, but really that has almost no impact on the process in the end. Uh, the class averaging, the refined 2D process, is really a reference-free process. Uh, the goal is to produce something that isn't reference biased. So, uh, no, there, you really can't do that in any useful way. Uh, if you want to do reference-based classification, uh, then there are other tools you can use for that. Uh, but we don't really have time to go through the details of that today. Uh, so let me mark that that's <coughs> answered. Okay, uh, the next question, do you always use high-pass filtered particles for 3D initial model refinement? Okay, <coughs> so no, you don't always use high-pass filtered particles. It depends on the project. So the high-pass filtering is a very, very low-resolution high-pass filtering, meaning it's only getting into the very low-resolution stuff. Now, in some particles like this Boreal data set, there were strong ice gradients present in the image. And I will show you... Here, let me show you here. My laptop's uh, fan is really racing now. So let me show you here what the high-pass filtered versus non-high-pass filtered particles look like. So let's look at this. Okay, so now I'm going. I'm now I'm showing you the high pass the non. Sorry, the, uh, those, so those are the high pass filters. So those are the high pass filtered ones. Now without the high pass filter, you can see there's only a very subtle change, but the subtle change is it's getting rid of gradients in the image. When you make 2D reference free class er averages, those gradients can cause you a bunch of problems because it may align the gradients. Uh, gradients across the whole image, or gradients no gradients across, across the particle. The particle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean they. They derive from gradients across the whole image. Uh, so I usually try and use the high-pass filtered ones, but there may be some projects where the high-pass filtering doesn't work really well. I would advise you to try it on a couple of images and make sure the high-pass filtering isn't getting rid of too much information in your particles. Some cases, like, for example, when I was doing calcium release channel, if I high-pass filter in that case, very often it's also getting rid of a lot of the low-resolution contrast in the particles, and that's not desirable. Okay, that's that for that question. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we have waiting. All right, now I really want to get this job running on the cluster because we're down to 18 minutes. Okay, so it's finished R syncing. So now I can SSH to Prism. And I have a current copy, as I've, I've told everyone in this lab anyway, I have a current copy of Eman 2 installed in user local Eman 2 on Prism. I also should have one installed on Taurus. Uh, but I know Taurus has been having some funny issues recently. Um, so all you should have to do to make use of that distribution is... Oh, so I'm using the copy in my home directory at the moment. But if we look in user local eman2, uh, you'll, there is a eman2.bashrc file there. Oh, hang on. Maybe it's not there. There was one there before. Oh, I think I know what happened. Sorry, I just updated it uh, this morning, and I I, I didn't regenerate the, uh, the, the the file. Normally, there will be an eman2.bashrc file there, and if you put that in your bashrc file, uh, then that's all you should need to have to, uh, to run eman. I'll regenerate it as soon as we're done with this uh, meeting. Okay, so you can see I've got a workshop Beijing, Beijing directory there. And that'll have my partially completed... Uh... Oh, I must have the project here that I... Uh, that's, that's from when I was testing this out yesterday. I'm going to remove it and I'm going to start again. Actually, no, here, I, I don't have to remove it. I'm going to go back to my laptop and I'm going to add the dash dash delete option to my rsync. What that will do is will delete any files on the remote computer that don't exist on the local computer. 
That's a very risky option, but in this case, I know what I'm doing. Okay, so now if I go back to Prism, in Workshop Beijing, it should be an exact clone of my laptop directory. So I can see the Refine01 directory where it has a partially complete refinement done. So now all we need is a script to submit to the cluster. So I already have a draft script, so we can get this going fast. Uh, I'm going to call it script2.pbs because we're going to generate the refine2 directory here. <coughs> And then I'm going to put the right refine command in there. Okay, so if we look at the script, it's saying I'm going to use only one node on the cluster, which has 16 cores. Uh, the 48 hours is, of course, completely completely wrong for this. It's it's not even going to run 12 hours. We'll just say that. Uh, then I have to cd to the correct directory, and then I have my e2 refine easy command. Now, where do I get this command from? If I go back to my local computer. and look at the project manager, <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and tell it that I'm going to run another refinement, but I'm not actually going to run it on my local machine. I'm going to run it on the cluster. So I'm going to use all the same parameters here, except the input file is going to be the big data set. And I don't know. Well, I, yeah, I won't change anything else. We'll just leave everything else the same. So now if I want to get that command, I just go to the command tab here, and it will show me the exact command I need to run from the command line to make that happen. So I'll copy that, and I'll go here, and I'll paste it on the cluster, and that should be it. I should just submit my, be able to submit my job. I want to change my what? Oh, cores. Yes, I do. You're right. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm actually going to say 24 instead of 16 here. Now, a few years ago, Intel introduced something called hyper-threading, which lets each processor on the computer do more than one thing at a time, sort of. Uh, when they introduced it, it was completely useless and didn't do anything good at all. But in the most recent processors they've put out, it actually can do something useful. So if I, if I actually... Give it more if, I'm using, if I'm using only one node... I can tell I want to use more threads than I actually have physical cores, and I'll actually get maybe a 20 or 30% speed up by doing it. If I'm running an MPI and using multiple core nodes, then I can still say threads equals 24, but the parallel option should not be extended like that. Okay, that looks good. Let's get it started. Script 2, DQ. Okay, so that's how we submit a job on Prism. And hopefully the cluster isn't completely full. And my job is running. And if I look in my directory, you'll see I now have a refine02 directory, which I can look at while it's running. So you can see it's already generated, uh, started generating the projections, <coughs> and it's going. All right, now. I've got my refinement running on the cluster, and I've got my refinement running on my local computer. How would I monitor the progress of that refinement as it's going? Now, you could just look at the files. I could do something like uh, tail.eman2log.txt, and that's the log file that eman generates while it's running. And that'll tell me the last command that it ran, and it'll even give me percent completion numbers that I could look at. It's not a very uh, graphical or intuitive way of doing it, though. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my laptop, and I'm going to do the opposite of the command that I just did a second ago. So before I did the rsync command, and I copied the data to the cluster, this time I'm going to rsync-avr. I'm not going to say delete. Uh, prism colon workshop Beijing period which will be the, means the current directory on my local machine. And that will copy the current directory to my local machine. Now you'll notice, uh, no, it's interesting that it copied some stuff in Refine01. It shouldn't really have. That probably means that there's still a date issue on the cluster. In other words, the time, there may be a time synchronization. Did, did you do anything about that yet? Okay, 
so the, the clock on the cluster isn't exactly the same as the clock on my computer, so uh, it thinks that uh, I may have uh, changed something there. It didn't copy much of anything, so it's, it's okay. It didn't hurt my, my local refinement. So if we go to Workshop Beijing, if we look at Refine01 here, we'll see that it's finished two iterations already. And uh, the remote one from the cluster, since I started it later, uh, is still working on the first iteration. All right, so let's take a look and see what we can see about the running job on the local machine and what we're getting. So let's open the browser, and we can look in Refine01. Let me go into Refine01. And again, we'll see all of these output files. Okay? If we look in the subdirectory that it creates in the refinement directory called re report, we'll see there's an index.html file there. If I double-click on that, it should open it up for me in my web browser. I could also look at it by hitting the info button, and it would open an e a window inside the eman2 system and show you the HTML file. This report is generated on the fly while the refinement is running. Okay, It starts at the beginning with an explanation of all of the parameters that it picked for you. So it used to be when you ran uh, in eman2.0, when you ran a refinement job, there was a whole long list of options. The refinement commands were like five lines long. Uh, in 2.1, it picks almost all the options for you. You can still override its decision with your own parameters if you like. <clears throat> but this is an explanation at the top of basically why it picked the parameters it picked. And it's based on looking at your data and looking at your resolution targets and all sorts of other things. So it's not just a set of default values. It's really looking at your data and picking intelligent uh, choices. Okay, now you can see it actually generates plots while it's running. After each iteration, it'll update the plot. Okay? So it gives us two things. We get a convergence plot, and we get a gold standard resolution plot. So the gold standard resolution plot, you can see it's got a little arrow pointing saying, our first iteration we got to about 10.3 angstroms. That's not too bad, although we gave it a pretty good starting level, so that's not a real shock, I guess. Uh, <coughs> and as it continues running, it hasn't, I guess it quite, hasn't quite finished iteration number two yet. Let's, let's look. Uh, yeah, it still hasn't quite finished iteration number two. So if I look at the output files here, the 3D files, 3D01, 3D02, 3D03, etc., those would be the actual 3D reconstructions that we got out. So let's, let's go ahead and take a look at what we got after one iteration. That's not bad. So after one iteration with only less than 1,000 particles, we can almost resolve alpha helices and about 10 minutes on a laptop. So right here, there's a pair, there's a, a two helix bundle right there that we're not quite separating yet, but we're, we're getting pretty close there, so that's not too bad. So we'll, we'll need to let it keep running. Um, so we can look at all these different files if we want. On the wiki, it explains what all these different files are and what all the contents are. Normally, the main things you'd want to look at are the 3D files. You might want to look at the uh, even and odd files and compare them to each other and that'll show you why the resolution is limited to, limited to what it's limited to. So I'm going to open them in the same window here and then I'm going to use this little slider trick to switch rapidly between them. So we can see what the even and the odd models look like. So you can see this is what a 10 angstrom resolution difference looks like. Okay, so those are the sorts of differences you get when the, when the structure is different at 10 angstroms. Okay, now that's a first iteration, so I don't expect things to be any better than that, right? The, the starting models we gave it were even worse than that. So this is what the... Hang on, go back to the control panel. Now we've got four maps open. Let's see. So these were the two starting models that it got. So those were phase randomized at something like 12 or 13 angstroms. So it went from that to that in one step. The other thing we might, thing we might want to look at is the class averages. So we can look at the even class averages, and we can compare those to the odd class averages, for example. 
And we can see that structurally they're pretty similar, but they're, they're not quite identical, and neither are the structures. So if we look at the side views, as you can see, we have very nice side views, and we have very nice top views, and we don't have very nice views in between. And that's just because of the preferred orientation in the data. They're, those orientations just don't exist in the data. So we can look at the even and the odd here and switch back and forth. And you'll notice there's one fewer in the odd than the, than the even. That just means that it hadn't put any particles in that set, in that particular class. Oh, it's got classes now for the second iteration. And yes, we've got a second 3, a 3D output file. So if we go back here to our web, web browser <coughs> and we refresh the view, we should see now that we have two iterations in our convergence plot. So you can see the first iteration, it was just terrible, right? That was, it was obviously phase, oops, sorry, phase randomized here in about, you know, I, I guess it looks like 17 or 18 angstroms. Uh, now it's converged fairly nicely. It started, started to converge fairly nicely. Uh, but the resolution curve hasn't actually gone very far. It's still different at about 10.4. And this is really because I only gave it 980 particles. It's not enough data to get to full resolution. So <clears throat> if you use all 5,000 particles in this data set, you can get to 7.8 angstrom resolution if you really fine tune everything and you use speed equals one and you mask it nicely, you can get to 7.8. Uh, I'll actually show you, I think I've got it posted somewhere. Where did I put it? Let me go to a different tab here. So if we go to the Eman2 mailing list, which is a Google group. Oops, wrong one. I posted something fairly recently comparing the different uh, software packages. Here we go. Yeah, here. So uh, this was a comparison that Stephen did uh, between Eman2, Freeline, and Reliant. So we now have good tools to move back and forth between the packages. If you have an Eman2 refinement that you've run, you can convert that into a Reliant project and run it in Reliant and then get the results back into Eman2. Or if you have a Reliant project that you set up fully in Reliant without doing Eman2 at all, you can take that and you can import it and make an Eman2 project on the fly. Uh, so you can see this is the raw output that you got from the three different packages. And after filtering them so they're all the same, you can see that they look very, very similar to each other. But Reliant took 160 hours. Uh, this Eman refinement took 12 hours. And as you can see, we can get pretty good results in about 20 minutes. Uh, and Free Align only took three and a half hours, but it started from Eman's output. So uh, it's not completely de novo. And if you look at the software provided Fourier shell correlation curves, you can see they overlap reasonably well. Uh, re uh, it looks like uh, Free Align is claiming uh, that it's a little bit better than the others. If you look there, but if you compare it to the crystal structure, you can see the Eman curves and the Reliant curves are almost right on top of each other here. And the free line curve is very slightly worse, but it's not a very big difference, right? I mean, it's not really a noticeable difference. And if you look at the structure, you know, the, the level of detail you can see in all three is, is quite comparable. Okay, so let's see. We were looking at our reports. So let's go ahead and do another rsync and see what we're getting from the cluster now. All right, looks like the cluster has finished its first iteration now. That's with all 5,000 particles. So we now can browse to the refinement directory. And I know it's almost noon here, so we'll probably run over just a few minutes, but we'll try not to, we'll, we'll try not to take it too far. Because we're supposed to have a nice going away party here today. All right, so we'll look at the refinement report now from the Refine02 directory, and we'll see that uh, the convergence plot, again, looks like the other one pretty much, and gold standard resolution. Ah, this one managed to get to 9.3 angstroms in its first cycle because it had more data. Now, I'll point out that I used speed equals 7 here, and I said I was going to say a little bit more about that. So there's this one parameter in the refinement now called speed, and that impacts a bunch of other things that the refinement command does. The speed ranges from 1 to 7. If you set the speed to 7, the refinement will run very aggressively and very fast. Uh, it will use a coarse angular sampling. 
I will not use any of the really advanced uh, alignment algorithms or anything like that. It'll just try and get your result as quickly as it can. And it'll still be pretty good. It just won't be as good. Um, if you set the speed to 1, it will oversample your data pretty heavily. You know, the angular sampling will be very fine. Uh, it will separate the data into multiple groups. It'll basically do all, pull out all the stops to try and get the resolution as best it can in a completely fair way meaning it won't, it won't tightly mask your structure or anything like that. It, the mask is still a big mask, and it's still doing all of the gold standard resolution criteria and stuff. I'm just saying that the parameters will be more optimized targeting high resolution. The difference in time between 7 and 1 is probably about a factor of 5. It's just a rough guess. The difference in resolution is typically going to be about 10%. So you can see I was getting to about 9.3 angstroms in that one round iteration on the cluster. That's running on one node on the cluster. If I had said speed equals 1, it would have taken more like an hour than, instead of 10 minutes on that one node. Uh, and the resolution should have been somewhere around 8 angstroms. Probably would take, uh, I mean, you can see based on the test that Steven, that, that Steven had there, I took uh, 12 CPU hours, so it should take about 45 minutes to be able to get that structure on one node on the cluster, uh, to be able to get you know that full resolution structure. So let's see. Well, that's actually exactly 12 right now. The refinement is still running, but that's that's fine. I mean, I think we demonstrated that we get so. Oh, we haven't actually looked at the refinement. Let's let's look at the one we got off the cluster, because it's supposed to be about an angstrom better. We can see if it looks any better. Ah, it is, right? So now you can make up the separation between those helices a little better. There's also some helices in here. It's still not perfect. I'd like to let it run for another round, a cycle or two, before uh, I expect to really start seeing the helices stand out perfectly. But if we play with the isosurface threshold a little, you can see we have those, those two helices up here are pretty well separated from each other. So reasonably good. Not bad for 15 minutes on a cluster. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any other questions before we wrap it up? Anything I said I was going to say and forgot to say? I think if you... No, no, I, I, look, I, I understand. So I, I in the recent tests I've done, I'd say if you're willing to be satisfied with an 8.1 angstrom resolution map, I think you could probably get it in about three or four CPU hours. If you want that ideal 7.8 angstrom resolution map, I, it might still take, you know, 10 or 12 CPU hours. So. Speed, you have to specify that. You specify speed. It picks all of the other parameters based on that. It will never change speed for you. You pick speed. Okay, so how often do you choose this element and after work? Yeah, so the normal way you would do it is you'd run a couple of, a few, you know, maybe three or four cycles with speed seven, make sure everything is converging nicely, uh, and then you can use this start from option. So if you look here, there are two ways of specifying. You can specify an initial model and you can specify a data set, mm -hmm. or you can say start from. And start from would be the name of a refinement directory, like refine02. And then it will pick up exactly where it left off with different parameters. So then I would, I, would, I would say start from, I would empty out these other two up here, and I would set speed to 1, or maybe 3, or 5, or something. 5 is a pretty good trade-off. The default value for speed is 5, and that's a pretty nice trade-off. It'll get you almost to the best resolution that you could get, and it'll still run pretty fast. Um, Seven is really just for when you're, you know, you just got your, your starting model, it really looks like crap, and you're trying to get it to a point where it's really, you know, has the right shape and stuff. Then you, then you do seven. So what about those other initial models which you say are, oh, this one is one you always see? Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. Let's, let's quickly look at that before we stop. Uh, so if we look in the initial models directory, uh, in addition to the output volumes and the starting volumes, you also have these aptcl files. And if we open that up, that's a comparison between the class averages and the projections 
for that particular answer. And what you hope to see, obviously, is that they match pretty well. And you can see here that they, they do. They match pretty nicely. If I look at that, for, say, example, the third one, which I noticed was really funny looking, uh, you'll see that, again, yeah, the side views actually still match reasonably well, but the top view just doesn't match well at all. Right, so you can already immediately detect from this, even if you, get, I mean, if you look at the structure, it's it's pretty obvious that if you know anything about Guriel, it should be pretty obvious that that's not a good structure. But uh, uh, if you don't know anything about Guriel and you're just starting from scratch, then the way you detect that you have a really bad starting model is to look at that. Is to look at those A particle files. You may not find it, it may not be able to detect it really clearly in every case. You know, if you've got some new particle and it's this tiny little blob and you're still figuring out what it looks like, usually once you've refined it for a little while, it'll become pretty clear that you're not on the right track and something's going wrong. But, uh, you know, there, there can be odd cases. If there's a lot of heterogeneity in the particle, then you may have this problem where the orientation gets confused with this, the flexibility of the structure, and there may not be one right answer. And that's actually where the value comes in of being able to run, uh, take an EMAN refinement and maybe run it also in, in Freeline or also in Relyon. Uh, if, you, if you put good data into any of those three software packages, you should get a good answer out. And you should get the same answer out, basically. If you put bad data into those three software packages, they all use different algorithms, and each of the different software packages will probably give you a somewhat different answer out. All wrong. All wrong, yes. Well, all non-trustworthy, right? right? So if you see yourself getting the same answer from all three packages, then you say you can probably be fairly certain because the algorithms that they use are just different, very different. So uh, it gives you a certain <coughs> level of confidence. It's not really a validation, but it's, it's useful. You still want to do tilt validation and, and other validations. But. All right, let me just do one last check and see if anyone else online asked any questions. I think we're okay. So... Good. I call that a, uh, a good initial test, and I'll be continuing to do these things uh, every uh, week or two uh, for the next few months. Very good. Thanks, everyone online, for joining.